how as indigenous people we we have the right to practice we have the right to relationship with the earth we have the right to stories um and i want to also say that i'm not going to reveal any any sacred teachings tonight i'm not a shaman i'm not a, <laughs> not a mythical yeah. mystic person i'm just a community member and uh, I can't speak on behalf of all Native people, even though my tribe claims me, I do not speak on behalf of all people. Uh, so anything that I share, I know this is true for you too, Juan, anything I share, I do it with a, in a good way, with an open heart, uh, but also protecting the people who have given me the gifts and acknowledging the people who, who have taught me, my teachers before me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us tonight for another edition of Life Saves the Planet, hosted by the GBH Forum Network. We are delighted tonight to have Don Knickerbocker and Juan Martinez with us, who will give us some profound insights into Native American culture and many things that I think we'll want to incorporate into our own in own, our own lives. So Don Knickerbocker, who I had the great pleasure of meeting at a conference where we were both speaking uh, in Yellow Springs, and uh, we have been in conversation since then, and she kindly agreed to join us tonight, belongs to the Ashinaabe people. She's a citizen of the White Earth Nation, enrolled member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe from the Otter Tail Pillager Band of Indians. She's an activist, advocate, organizational strategist, land and water defender, and a leader in the philanthropic sector. She believes that peace is not merely a distant goal, but can be achieved within our lifetime through deeply connected and authentic relationships with the land and the people. Having spent over 20 years of her work life as a grassroots organizer on the front lines of earth-related matters, she now serves as the president of the Greater Cincinnati Native American Coalition, co-founder of Warren, Ohio, and co-leader at Yellow Springs Climate Action. Dawn spent the majority of her career working in nonprofit leadership and in practice of reciprocity within, re, within philanthropy. She worked as a grant maker in Washington State when she designed and implemented Spokane Arts Grants Awards that serves over a million people. Don recently worked as the Director of Foundation Relations at Antioch College and now works full time for Native Americans in philanthropy, which has, serves all of Indian country on cultural and tribal issues. Don is the former elected chair of the Advisory Commission on Diversity for the most diverse city in the state of Washington, Renton. She is a published nonfiction writer, poet, public speaker, columnist at the Yellow Springs News Little Thunders and the 2020 Martin Luther King Drum Major for Justice Award recipient. Don holds a bachelor's degree in organizational management from Whitworth University, completed graduate work in social impact back from Claremont Lincoln University, and a master's in arts in human rights practice from the University of Arizona. Her latest anthology is titled Navigating the Pandemic, Stories of Hope and Resilience. She lives in Yellow Springs, Ohio, with her husband and four sons and 49 medicinal plants. And she's only 20. I can't wait to see what she'll do next. Juan Martinez is a senior program manager at the Aspen Institute for Community Solutions and proud descendant of the Baena Za Zapotec people. He is a co-founder of Fresh Tracks, a youth-led cross-cultural revolution rooted in the healing power of the outdoors, as well as implementing the tribal and indigenous community of practice for the Opportunity Youth Forum. His work has helped to grow the silo breaking and community organizing that is so direly needed. Juan has over 15 years of nonprofit management and implementation of strategy and was named a National Geographic Explorer in 2011 for his work to engage the rising generation of youth to the healing power of the outdoors. 
Juan also serves on the Wilderness Society's Governing Council, is a TED speaker and author, and is dedicated to bringing the power of equity and justice to life through youth and community-driven solutions. He has committed to help empower the next generation of leaders dedicated to addressing systems of inequity and access to opportunities by working with community leaders, nonprofits, and businesses across the country. Juan resides in Blanco, Texas with his wife, Vanessa. And I would just add that I watched a video on his website of a group of, of young people that he works with from all over the country. And we really, uh, I feel that I really have a lot to learn from him because here and all over the world, young people are having a really hard time with what's going on on earth and we can fix it. And that's why it's so important that both Juan and Don are here today. So your turn, take it away. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here today. And uh, I'm so glad to be with Juan, my friend, my colleague. Um, and I want to, um, I really want to invite everybody into an indigenous practice um, as we begin. So as I was introduced, I'm Don Nickelbacher and I belong to the Anishinaabe people from my Earth Nation called Gawabab Ginnikag in my language. Um, and uh, right now I am on the land of the Shawnee and the Miami people in Yellow Springs, Ohio. I'm in a place where uh, the rivers merge and they come together to form great and nourishing waters for the people. Uh, I'm in a place where the stars shine brightly at light at night and the insects light the sky in the summer months. Um, and in our traditional way, we always introduce ourselves, um, visiting guests and gracious hosts. And we begin by naming our traditions, our places, our names, Sometimes today we call that a land acknowledgement. Um, and I'll let Juan do, uh, tell us where he's coming from today. Thanks, Don. Scarupe yada tu nala ya Juan, Chinje, Alicia y Daniel, Kinya Ishmu Tewantepe, Comitanciu, Zapotec. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Juan Daniel Martinez Pineda. Uh, my mom is Alicia and my dad is Daniel. Um, they res my mom resides, comes from the East Moose of Tehuantepe uh, in the mountains of Oaxaca of those Zapotec people. And in our ways, we start with acknowledging each other, acknowledging our parents um, and those who gave us life and acknowledging the mountains from where we came from. And so that's, um, that was the East Mosa de Guantepe in Oaxaca. So welcome everyone. And we invite you into this uh, tradition and culture uh, as you explore and, and become familiar with that we all stand on native land. I stand today and I'm beaming to you from the land of the Humanos and the Cahualtecan people here in what is now uh, named uh, Blanco, Texas, but it is unceded territory from the native people as well, too. Yeah, that is beautiful. In the Western tradition, people often start off with talking about what you do and um, your agenda, your work, how you may extract resources. Uh, but instead, we want uh, people to put in the comments where you are coming from, whose land you're on, who are your relatives, um, and uh, who are your ancestors. So we'd love to see those comments. Uh, today, we, Juan and I, we're going to have a conversation. Um, we're going to talk about the work that we do, um, the model that we use as Indigenous people to solve um, some of the crises that we're faced with today. Uh, we'll talk about um, our economic and social exchanges um, that are different in our worldview 
Um, and then we'll talk about what justice means. Um, so I'd like to start off our conversation um, with the idea of conservation and environmentalism and justice and, and what that really means um, to us as indigenous people. So um, I guess I'll start off by saying that in our indigenous languages and in our indigenous culture, there's no word for environmentalist or environmentalism. Uh, those types of ideas and thoughts are embedded within all of our languages, our origin stories, um, and who we are as people. So there was really not um, a need for that. There's some new words that have evolved over time in different communities as we've had to face um, protection. Um, but just to frame this conversation about what that means, we've now had to um, take up justice, um, meaning to make whole again, um, to return to a place of indigeneity. Um, so I'd like to open that question up one, what does environmental or um, conservation mean to you? Yeah, thanks, Don. And it's, it's just beautiful to hear you reflect on that as well, too. And I think for me, I always, as I was introduced to this concept of environment and environmentalism or conservationism, it always seemed odd to me that there was this wedge between between the two, like, or between us and something else. And for me, in, in the ways that my parents brought me up, there was never a separation of either. Wherever we went, we still carried our seeds with us. Wherever we went, even in the middle of South Central LA, where I grew up in, we still found a way to set down roots and grow our crops and our medicine. And for me, that, that has always resonated. Unbeknownst to me, that was part of the culture that they were passing on early on. To me, those were just, those were just chores that I had to do every weekend uh, or clean, you know, make sure that the plants were watered and everything like that. But, but unconsciously and subconsciously, they were passing on this, this culture and tradition that's so ingrained into me now that home, wherever I go in this world, home, I have to plant. I have to put something into the ground. So that um, so that I feel like it's it's there, and and that to me uh, has always brought me to this space of of when people speak about the environment or about conserving something, it's it's never it, it was never about conserving the land. It was about conserving ourselves. It was about conserving culture and traditions, and and the dreams of our ancestors, and and those dreams still live in the trees and in the water and in, in the rivers and, and to separate the two just doesn't make sense. Even when early on uh, as, as, uh, in, as Mexico was being colonized and there was a revolution of a native indigenous people to fight that, the call to, to, to action was uh, tierra y libertad, land and liberty, right? Because the two go so hand in hand together that Mm -hmm. To us, freedom means being connected to the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I know. I personally, I grew up on a, a goat farm in the, the 70s, and that's where I went to um, find my snacks and yeah. <laughs> always, always hands in the dirt and also in interaction with animals and exploring the environment. Um, having reverence for the seeds and the plantings um, and the work, the work together, that's, that was family life um, for me growing up. And it was such an incredible gift. Later, when we moved to urban areas, we kept a lot of that um, work with the land, always having gardens and growing seeds and foods. And we moved to a place later when I was a preteen where I would forage um, and pick berries and make little tartlets for gifts when uh, you know somebody needed comfort or help. Mm. Um, and 
you know, talk with the bark on the trees and, and feel the textures of the earth uh, wading through the water, protecting the fish and the wildlife. That was the joy of my life was being outdoors. Yeah. Even though we were pretty much in an urban area, I found space. I was really fortunate. Many people don't, don't have that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think today, um, when we think about um, justice and we think about what environmental racism looks like, and how we're intersecting um, where we're at right now um, with racial reckoning movements um, and the burdens that people have with access to uh, the outdoors. We can think about um, power plants and pipelines being in close proximity to areas where there's predominantly people of color. We can look at highways um, with vehicles running through and dividing neighborhoods. Um, we can look at people who are in flight paths uh, where it's loud and difficult to breathe, people not having access to green spaces to walk or to bike, um, to enjoy, um, their time with their family and their friends. And we also see that there's a lot of privilege in uh, people who are able to experience nature, um, people who are able to be outdoors to recharge with me time or some of the other terms that we hear right now. I mean, it's really, it's literally people of color um, who are sick and dying at higher rates because they have been exposed to the cumulative burdens of environmental racism. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's environmental racism, environmental justice to me looks is is a lot about writing almost an like an original wrong. And so many of our ancestors, whether um, uh, of, of Native and Indigenous roots of African uh, roots have been violently separated from our traditions and our lands, and and when when we go back to thinking about those the, those our ancestors in our communities, the first thing that they always sought out was was water and food and and access to that, and and where those communities settled was where you found some of the cleanest water and the most pristine communities around and the most abundant um, harvesting possible. And then and then we were violently separated from that. And, and I think a lot of what environmental justice tries to do is to return to that mode of, of indigenous values, of recognizing that we all need clean water and clean air and clean and access to food that we can actually touch with our own two hands and see in our own backyards or, or windows um that that a lot of that is is really ancestral intuition almost and and uh it, it is ingrained in us that we we have to do that and so much of what has happened in the last century and 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 millennia is is a lot of that disconnect and so uh you know, sometimes we have to interrogate we the history of the National Park Service or public lands and how that came to be and who was left out of um, who was literally pulled out of those spaces to create this version of a pristine community that was not touched by people, right? And and uh, I mean, those words are literally written into into some of the like like you said, well, the Wilderness Act in 1964 a land that is not um touched by man and and you say that to a native and indigenous person well are you talking about a white man that hasn't touched it because we've been we've been here a long time um but but yeah i think i think uh you know back to the point it, it, environmental justice i think tries to right that original wrong yeah and tell those stories in the accurate ways yeah. you know those like um, I'm reminded of 
um, like this wild movement. Um, and, and some of the new movements um, that want to address things like climate change or um, they're still using those Eurocentric savior complex tools. Um, but when you erase the stories of the people, then you're not putting things wild at all. Because right. Right. <laughs> this, this place was not an Eden. This yeah. place had many gardens. It also had problems. Some of like the greatest highways uh, across this country were built by indigenous people. Yeah. The villages that um, provided shelter and safety for settlers were built by indigenous people. Yeah. Uh, the, the foods, the seeds saved. So many of our corn relatives mm -hmm. would have been lost altogether had not the people hid them in their cheeks. And that was a way to, um, to protect those sacred seeds. Many, many foods were lost, many were burned. And we have to recognize that we continue to save seeds. 80% you know, of the world's uh, biodiversity is held in the hands of indigenous people. Mm. And we take that as our sacred responsibility to keep passing seeds and foods and gifts and the bounty of nature in harmony with the people along to the next generation and generation and generation. Yeah. You know, have you heard of like the seven generations? Yeah. You know, like what you do today, they're going to experience there. Yeah. yeah. We always have to think of that. And I think uh, just adding to that stream of thought as well, I think the pandemic raised a lot of that resilience. Like, you know, does when when stores started closing and you couldn't access tomatoes or fresh food because there was uh, the fear of, of the virus being transmitted to that, how many people were able to go know how to how to plant a seed and how to harvest and how to how to track a forage? Yes, exa exactly, right? And, and uh, I, I think a lot of that is, is, is access to that knowledge, access to, to those traditions. Um, we, we can take a lot of that for granted now um, because then a lot of people, many people that have the privilege to can walk into a store and buy organic, even if they can afford it. Um, but many people don't even have access to a store near their neighborhood within a five mile radius. And, and there's such things as, as food deserts, right? And why, how, how can, how does environmental justice address that? I think there's, there's a big movement around resilience and self-reliant food and, and just, or, you know, urban agriculture, urban farming, uh, these new <laughs> trend setting things that have always been traditions for us in, yeah. in our ways. And <laughs> to us, it's always been survival and, and tradition and culture to pass this on. So, yeah. so more of that, right? Like more of the of centering indigenous values into environmental justice. Like these are not new terms. These are not new terminology. These are new, not new ideas, really. They're, they're yeah. grounded in the core core elements of who we are as people. Yeah, these are the values that, you know, we can live, we can live through. Yeah. I, want to, I want to know and ask you, what brought you into the revolution that you're now in and all of this incredible work that you do and founding Fresh Tracks and... Yeah. So for me, it, um a lot of it starts almost like I mentioned early what is is uh, unknowingly being in, ingrained and passed on a lot of a lot of values and culture from my parents from my mom and dad and so starting with them and even remembering my grandma in Oaxaca and the things that she would teach me back then and um so it's a lot of that it was always there uh, and then we we migrated up to to the U.S. and um, 
established in LA in South Central Los Angeles, where I grew up. And that that um, that was really a, a place for me to to uh, where I, I I I as hard as my parents tried, I became disconnected. I I just could not see a future for myself. I became I was lost uh, for for lack of words. And there was a pro program in my high school um, where they ultimately, if you end up in detention, they give you an ultimatum. You can either go stay in detention or you can try out these alternative ways of serving your detention sentence. And one of those was uh, our high school urban farming program called Food from the Hood. And that, that automatically uh, snapped me back to the moment that my mom and dad were teaching me to uh, caretake for my plants at home. And I felt like such a screw up at that moment in my life that I felt like this is the one thing that I could do right. And so I dedicated myself to growing these jalapenos that I picked out um, because I wanted to make salsa for my mom at the end. And then um, after that, I, I just kept going back to school and then I'll, a lot of that just clicked. It wasn't, it wasn't science. It wasn't, um, it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't punishment for something that I was doing. It was, it was rooting me back to, to what my parents and the love that they had for me was able to do. And, and I went back to school, I came back and, and really became something that I, I'm, um, uh, trying to do more of, and I got an opportunity to to visit the Teton Science Schools through one of my mentors, Miss Glenda Pepin. She made an opportunity available to me, and and uh, the the uh, land of 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 the Cheyenne uh, up in up in Wyoming, and in that moment, I, I, I when I when I got to see nature in in that form uh, in the world in in that space something just clicked all of a sudden there was this love and passion and heart here in the middle of a river in the middle of the mountains and back in LA in my community that that it, it just brought it all together and I had to figure out a way to encourage others to find their path to that feeling as well too where they could feel connected to everything and that's what I've been dedicating, I think, the rest of my life to is to empower others to find their path forward in the best way for them. And for me, it was through through finding a connection by connecting those two dots. And for many people, it will look different, right? And but but my value that carries me forward is to encourage others to find that path for them forward. And and that's how I ended up um, at Fresh Tracks and and really centering. Um, like Representative Ayanna Presley has said many times, those closest to the pain, closest to the power, and how do you how do you really turn over some of that power over to them? Yeah. Um, how did you end up over here, Don? Uh, <laughs> how did you call raise the call to action revolution? Yes. <laughs> well, for me, I mean, mine was kind of similar to yours, where it was rooted in childhood and the love of outdoors and and the environment my animals and that were my friends and the plants that I cared for but it was also some experiences that were um shocking to me mm. um I remember a time when I was young and going to uh, one of my first cultural events it was um, a powwow um, in Warm Springs, and that's a reservation in Oregon. And um, it was just my dad and I, and we went, I think I was probably 13 or so. And I was told to go with some of the other women and go sit in a kind of a tent and watch for other people. And this was, you know, Seventh, late 70s, early 80s. Boy, my memory's going. <laughs> and we were watching for people coming because um, the grown-ups were doing ceremony. And at that time, it was still like not really legal. 
So it, we weren't really allowed to practice our culture until the 1978 um, Native American or American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Yeah. And so I didn't know the laws at the time, but I remember sitting in that little space, learning to weave baskets and being told about, uh, you know, the secrets and how we needed to keep ourselves secret mm -hmm. and how we needed to keep our culture secret. And it was such a special time being with those women and learning what I learned and the stories that we shared together. But it was also deeply sad that it was, it, it couldn't be done um, as, as just a regular person, as just a part of who we are, yeah. like it had been before. You know, they all had stories of how it used to be okay and how everybody used to be able to go. But um, now there were authorities who were on the lookout for this kind of bad ceremony. Yeah. Anyway, that really impacted my view of how as indigenous people, we, we have the right to practice we have the right to relationship with the earth. We have the right to stories. Um, and I want to also say that I'm not going to reveal any, any sacred teachings tonight. I'm not a shaman. I'm not a, <laughs> not a mythical, yeah. mystic person. I'm just a community member. And uh, I can't speak on behalf of all Native people, even though my tribe claims me, I do not speak on behalf of all people. Yeah. Uh, so anything that I share, I know this is true for you too, Lon, anything I share, I do it with a, in a good way, with an open heart, uh, but also protecting the people who have given me the gifts and acknowledging the people who, who have taught me, my teachers before me. Yeah. Um, thanks, for, thanks for that reminder. Don and yeah, we don't we don't speak for all native and or and or indigenous people. <laughs> That's a major disclaimer up front. Um, uh, because I, I also just want to highlight that not because someone says they are native or indigenous does not mean that they speak for all native and indigenous people. There are many different cultures, traditions, uh, ceremonies, language. Um, skin tones, ways of regalia and, and dressing. So because you've met one native person or one indigenous person, it does not mean that you've met the whole sector. It, it, you know, if you're related to a native person or an indigenous person, it does not mean you speak for all native or indigenous people. Um, and I think that's that's something that's, that's almost uh, uh, ingrained in, in all, and all Native people is that we speak from the heart, from our heart, and, and the teachings that we've been blessed to be, um, to have and carry with us, but does that, that does not mean that we know everything or know everyone, uh, and we have a lot to learn, and I think that, that, that's one trick, like, that's one value that's been ingrained into me, that I am constantly in mode of learning and continuously looking to understand and learn from everything and everyone. And, and I think that's, that's almost a perfect segue into, into our next part, which is, you know, how can others engage in this work? And, and uh, what, what, do, what can we encourage our, our viewers here today to, to practice and engage with? So Don, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. I mean, first of all, we need to center indigenous wisdom. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I know that that probably means to many people in the audience or who are listening to this at a later time that, that maybe they aren't indigenous. And so that means that they can't participate in this kind of wisdom, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, I was told a story, um, actually several times I was told this story for different people and little bit different ways. And so I feel like it's okay for me to share it now is 
that there's kind of this um, way that we think about ourselves as Anishinaabe people, as Ojibwe people, that long ago it was told that we would go out into the world and we would start to lose a lot of our practices and our language and our way of life and our ability to be within our community. We'd be extracted and pulled further and further out into the world with so much loss. But there would come a time when we would start to return to our ways. We would learn our languages again, our languages that held the sacred teachings of our plant relatives and our animal brothers and sisters and our moons and our rhythms. And then we would start to come closer and closer back to our original knowings and ways to be in relationship with the earth. But this time we wouldn't be alone. This time we would have people beside us. And I'm reminded by different people who work in the scientists realm and in the sciences um, that it takes you know, 10 to 12 generations for somebody's DNA to transform into relationship with the land that they're on. And so we're at a point in many different places in the world that have been colonized where people are now biologically um, connected to the land that they're on and mm -hmm. that they now have this sacred responsibility with them, within them as well. And that they do need to reach back and find those sacred instructions uh, to um, also share that with other people to use privilege in a different way, to make sure that they're, um, they're not just retreating for themselves. They're not just giving to other people, but instead they're sharing. Um, yeah. yeah, so build your own awareness. Your awareness of your own indigeneity, but also listen to indigenous leaders. Yeah. My grandpa Dewey used to say, two ears, one mouth. We listen <laughs> twice as much as we speak. Yes. I'm sure he's not the only grandpa to ever say that. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. I, uh, I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was, I was, I was just going to share, I think for Sometimes there's this entitlement that comes with being exposed to certain traditions or ceremonies or invited to or, or gaining access to a certain amount of knowledge. It does not mean that you have to share it. It does not mean that you have to portray it or adapt it to your own way. I think there's a lot of, I grew up with a lot of recognizing the level of my elders and seeking out uh, uh, permission and recognition from them to be able to do something and, and carry those traditions forward. If and some, it's not like a you put in an application and then you get an approval stamp. It is, it is one of the hardest things for me to understand, especially as I as I became integrated into into this U.S. society, U.S. centric society or Eurocentric society, where things are like that. You know, you put in an application, get your driver's license. And you're an adult, right? Or or a version of an adult. Um, but but for me, it was it was very much like waiting for the right time and waiting to be told, okay, you can do this, or okay, you can be the one who uh, uncovers the uh, um, the 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 birria from the from the center of of the of the cookout uh, for for our traditions like our big traditions our big you know family gatherings like we we cook and and put either um uh goat or 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 beef uh into into the earth and let it cook in coals and that's a tradition that is you know goes way back um and is passed on and there's there's obviously there's people who, who can teach you about it now but in the way I learned it was very much being being in, in there in, in ceremony with my my family, and you know there's there's those kind of moments where it's like you have to be invited, 
and you know the, the little kids couldn't come in yet like they had to go play and if you got nearby you got you got scolded um but but there are there are so many of those traditions that i think as we center and explore our own history and in our own life we start to recognize what those traditions are and what that culture is and i encourage each of you to explore those traditions and cultures that have not to start some of your own and you know you know to to a lot uh, of people that i know now it's, it's no longer about thanksgiving it's about recognition rec recognizing the the land and the people on that day and uh the native land that you stand on and there's a whole movement that's happening around that moment as well too and recognizing the 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 celebration of what has been one of the original wrongs of this country as it was built. Yeah, yeah, truth telling. I think that that's yeah. one of the, the most important things people can do. You know, we talk a lot about reconciliation as part of healing, but we should recognize that that assumes that there was a good relationship to return to. And so sometimes it's not a reconciliation that is needed, but instead it is a truth telling and mm -hmm. it is opening up of healing. Yeah. Um, it's um, appreciating the authority of indigenous wisdom. Uh, you wouldn't believe how many times I've been invited to say what other people want me to say. Yeah. Mm. As an <laughs> Anishinaabe key, I, I, don't want to say what other people want me to say. I really have to <laughs> speak from the heart. And sometimes it's not, uh, you know, I'm very anti-racist and that work can be radical. But I like to think of it as the original definition of radical in the English language, which I think was like from the 1400s or something, which means of the root. Mm. It means that it's in the ground. It's changing things from where it begins. That's the radical change we need it's deep down within us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Our, that was. A, <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah, and there's power in words too. I mean, I I I am learning my my traditions and my cultures and really really leaning into my indigenous identity 30 years into my life life, right? Like I I I always knew there was a connection with with my mom and and my grandma, but up until and, and I always wanted to learn the language, but one of the things that I that I started doing the pandemic was really to lean into the language and and start to keep that language alive uh, in those traditions and lean into my indigenous identity as part of who I am and really learning who, who I am. I credit you as part of you know helping me guide that and Nikki Petrie at the Center for Native American Youth and Mm -hmm. Eric Stegman at Native Americans yes. is part of my mentors to like really allow me to enter that space and say, yeah, I am indigenous. There is part of me in this identity in this space <laughs> that um, that belongs here. And 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 once you once you learn that and and really take the time to learn and to listen and to know the ways of, uh, I mean, they're so universal and. And I think it also brings about this 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 uh, this way of of decolonizing the ways that we're we're thinking about this space as well too. And so it's impacted my own lens of work because decolonizing the way that we've been doing, I think it's just rooting again the the radical mentality of what we've been talking about, and and talking about how we can start to look beyond what we know now and what has been done in the past to really look seven generations down and and, and not know exactly what what that seventh generation is going to do with the seed that we plant today but knowing that we've done our part to 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 set them up for success and and thrive uh in their livelihood and i think that 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 paradigm of like you we have to measure success by every quarter we have to measure success by return on investment, or we have to measure success by amount of impact is, is something that I think in, in, our, in our shared work, 
we're starting to really um, lean into and, and start to invite more of that thinking and critical critical uh, creation of and co-creation of what a space like that can look like. That's right. Yeah, we're changing how resources are delivered and accepted and shared with communities. That's the big work we are doing together. Um, I'm looking at the clock um, and let's invite Adam back into conversation with us to see if he has some questions from our audience and uh, we'd love to hear his thoughts. Hi, Adam. Hi. Uh I um, I could tell you my thoughts, but that would take hours. So, so I'll start with some other people's questions. How do we support stewardship and reciprocal relationships in our ur urban parks and community growing spaces with folks of all ages? I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so the reciprocal relationship is present in everything um, we we see everything around us we can't we don't live in a vacuum and so coming from that viewpoint understanding that we are the earth that we are our environment that we have the deep responsibility of the people who live in these urban spaces who are packed together uh, those the, the least of us are the most important. They reflect who we really are. And so to be reciprocal is to get to know the people uh, where they're at. Um, in my own work, um, part of the Greater Cincinnati Native American Coalition, we have 12 urban garden beds that we put up during the pandemic. And we've uh, used a number of volunteers and then we've delivered um, indigenous foods to the local schools um, that, are, that are near. Um, and so when I think about urban spaces and um, engaging with communities, I think about being very super hyper local and understanding in concentric circles what is around you. What do you have in resources in your own environment and care for that? And then go further and further out from yourself and really deeply understand what you have and what you have a relationship to, Be both grateful and giving. Um, that's how you practice reciprocity. Giving. Well, really, that it, when you are when you're doing both of those things, that's actually, I think Vine Deloria wrote about it in the 1960s. It's, you know, the indigenous practice isn't as much giving because that's kind of a power situation, but it is the sharing. So you are um, acting in, um, with respect and dignity for those around you, even those in need, need, uh, deep dignity. So I do like the word sharing more than giving myself. And one of the things about that that strikes me is that when you do that, you have no idea what you've started and where in terms of where it's going. And, and the, the, it's magic. Yeah, in a way how it just is is carried all over. When, when people are inspired. Yeah, I think I, I, in, in addition, you know, when I think about magic, I think about spiritual. And it, mm -hmm. I think that to me is spiritual, like the, the exchange of ideas, the exchange of caring and love and caretaking, um, that, that, that is spiritual. And I think the moment when you don't know what's going to happen with it, like, or what is going to be done with it, that that's a lot of trust uh, that has to happen for, for that, for, for native people. And I think, you know, you look at the history, there's a lot of mistrust and a lot of trust that has been broken. And um, the, when people question, I think when I've heard the question posed to me about like, well, why don't you X, Y, and Z, 
It's like, because the trust is not there, you haven't built mm -hmm. the trust to begin with for the caring and the giving or the sharing to happen. I, I think representative of that is when you watch, you know, just kind of symbolic in a way, is that the plots that you see on Netflix are all about mistrust. Mm. The entire mm. movie industry would fall apart if people actually <laughs> trusted each other. Yeah, that's such an excellent, excellent point. And I want to say, to add on to that, that when we think about leadership, even within the movies, uh, leadership is not ever present in any of those movies that show strong leaders because those leaders are always like in crisis and they're gonna solve something. Real leadership, and this is an indigenous wisdom, real leadership is boring. It is like everybody is at peace. That's because your leader has been supporting you this whole time. Mm -hmm. Like the stories of indigenous leadership would be so boring. It would never make Netflix. It'd be like, hey, where's, where's, uh, where's the chief today? Oh, he's taking a nap. Okay. I think I'll take taking a nap a too. <laughs> taking a nap because his people are at peace. His people are fed. His people have homes. His people have love. His people have community. They have food. They have clean water. That's leadership. Yeah. Oh. And, and a life without conflict is almost unimaginable in, yeah. in Western culture. Okay, we have a question about um, what are some national or regional organizations or businesses that would be good for an aspiring ally to volunteer or, or support? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, my, my first, my always to the top of the mind is Eighth Generation. So it's, it is a native, native owned, native run company up in, up in a, based out of Seattle, Washington, but they do a lot of work and their, their, their whole slogan is native inspired natives, not native inspired. Um, yeah. so <clears throat> definitely encourage you to check out their, their website. They do amazing work and a lot of great work. Um, other organizations to consider beyond uh, Don's amazing work at the national scale through Nas Native American Philanthropy, Center for Native American Youth uh, is, is another one that I would highly uh, advocate for to for people to check out. Uh, Cheyenne River Youth Project. And there's a lot. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, can, we can do a whole list and, and do a lot, but these are some of the names that come to the top here about amazing people doing amazing, great work out there. So tell them that we'll put that in chat. It'll be a resource. Um, okay. Here's a question about what are the most pressing climate and racial justice issues in Massachusetts, which is not quite a fair question for the two of you since you're not in Massachusetts. But maybe um, you can give a kind of a broader perspective on that. Yeah, you know, climate is not the weather. So whatever's happening in Massachusetts, it's happening on the planet. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Oh, it's really weird here. I mean, the past three weeks, it'll be 90 degrees. Then the next day, it'll be 60 degrees. And then up to 90 and down, you know, a real roller coaster ride. Yeah, yeah. what I would say, what I would say is, is that I think certainly from the rising generation and that, and I see it everywhere that I work in. And that's sometimes we, we as the current generation and leadership and sometimes, uh, you know, as elders now, we tend to draw the stopian pictures of like what the situation is right now or what it can be. And I think for, for me, the, the one message that I would share is to look at the rising generation and, and make sure that they know that there's a there's that they they're not the leaders of tomorrow they're the leaders of today and that they have a lot to contribute to make sure that those those um, things don't happen 
And remember that Dr. King did not say he had a nightmare. He didn't draw out a nightmare for us. He said, I have a dream. And he drew beautiful mountains and put people in those mountains towards the arc of justice. So we need, we need to do a better job at drawing out, drawing out and painting those dreams so others can see themselves in it, especially the rising generation. Yeah. Climate change. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, one last question. Um, what indigenous insights can we adapt for growing and distributing food in a way to help heal people and the earth? Well, we should, we should talk about and we should actually address the basis, basic cause of the issues, including climate change, which is drum roll, extractive and settler colonialism, which sees the earth itself as a resource, including people of color and people of culture with, as resources to be mined. And we are all in trouble if we allow systemic, the systemic genocide of the Earth's indigenous caretakers to vanish. Uh, so number one, we must center our indigenous wisdom. We must look to the indigenous leaders in this moment. Um, and as Juan said, a lot of that knowledge is within the bones of the youth who have that in there, they have the energy to carry that on. Um, I know that there's um, an organization up in Minnesota, um, they're rebuilding after some of uh, what happened during the George Floyd protests. Um, they're called Natives and it's run by um, Sean Sherman. He's trying to help bring food and seed uh, back to the people supporting native farmers and um, so that's a great place to connect. Um, but it's, it's really supporting the, the indigenous people being able to be in public again, being able to be who they are. Imagine that. Uh, I think we have time for <laughs> one more. Um, quick one, uh, is there a place for intergenerational households in the world we live in now in order to continue passing down traditions and culture with the added benefit of addressing housing shortages and homelessness? <laughs> I mean, that in itself is an indigenous value, right? Like this, this idea that you, you had to separate family into different households. I mean, yeah, like it, it's, a, it's a practice, but, but intergenerational households were a lot more common in, in, in the original ways than, than they are now. And so, um, so yeah, I think that that's, that's certainly a space to, to reconsider and, and we're seeing almost like a, a reflection of that with many, um, many younger professionals having to live at home because one, they can't afford to uh, because the current situations, economic and colonialism and, you know, Eurocentric ways of doing things. Um, and, and now you have you find yourself like oh yeah this feels kind of good this feels right and there's there's family and love and traditions to be passed on as well too and so yes I think that there is there is there's space and there's a reality as well there too to observe and say how we're going actually we're, we're going back to some of those indigenous ways okay well I'm afraid we're out of time just about so I want to thank both of you, um, I, you know, I love you both now. <laughs> and, and it's, uh, I'm not used to declaring those kinds of things in public, although I have at times, but you're, you're filling me with um, kind of peace mm. that I need, the work that I do. <clears throat> and I'll put in the plug for biodiversity for livable climate here. The work that I do is really stressful. It's seven days a week. I'm not good at taking time off. And I need moments 
like this, and I appreciate moments like this. And I hope I learn to be able to share moments like this. I almost said good, Don, uh, give moments like this, but I caught myself. So you're making progress with, <laughs> with one person at least. Yeah. And um, yeah, and it's important for the people who, <clears throat> the other people who work at, at Bio for Climate that I do this because what I do affects what they do and, and vice versa. So, um, and I just want to say something about our organization. Uh, Biodiversity for a Livable Climate is a nonprofit, and we are delighted to be presenting this uh, Life Saves the Planet series. And we specialize in good news. So if you want doom and gloom, I'm afraid you'll have to go somewhere else yeah. because what we see around the world, I mean, you get this noise from the, the Western media that just, oh my God, this, and oh my God, that, and we'll never make it. And meanwhile, there are millions of people around the world, um, largely indigenous, who are tending to their little piece of the earth and regenerating and figuring out how to get more water and, mm -hmm. and to teach their neighbors. I mean, literally millions of people. You, you probably know of La Via Campesina, which is an international organization, a peasants movement. They represent 200 million smallholder farmers. And they advocate for the rights of women and education of girls and for regenerative agriculture and all kinds of land and seed sovereignty. All, yeah, land and seed sovereignty, Paula reminds me. And <laughs> it's it's um, there is so much good news out there. It's it's like you're walking around in this psychotic world, doom and gloom. Oh, good news, but the good news, you know, it gets out shouted. And so our job is to bring it bring it back uh, to the people. So again, thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward to future conversations. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow, one.